Hello everyone, I'm a recovered alcoholic and my name is Joanne. Hey Joanne. I, uh, my sobriety date is August 24th, 2014. I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous since early April of 2007. Um, little, little gap between the arrival at my first meeting um, and any sort of thing resembling sobriety. <laughs> I, uh, I'd like to thank Marlene for being such a gracious host this weekend, um, and I'd also like to thank the organizing committee um, and congratulate District 62 on 75 years of, of this Roundup weekend. Uh, we all get to show up and have pancakes and sit and listen to speakers and drink coffee and have fellowship, but... I know that an event of this nature takes months of committee meetings, um, arguing, <laughs> making of amends, <laughs> <laughs> coordinating, uh, practicing of principles, um, in an effort to put a weekend like this together so we can all show up and be together. And, and what a weekend to be together after so many, a few years of not being able to um, congregate and be in person. So thank you to everybody, from the concession workers to the people working the literature table all weekend. Thank you for giving your time for Alcoholics Anonymous and, and for our, our great fellowship. Uh, my home group is the Way Out group that meets um, every day at noon at the Langley Alano Club. Um, I am a, a sometime hanger-on at the Keystone group. Um, my current service position is uh, I'm the district committee member for my home district, District 43. Um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to my fellow DCM, um, uh, Janie, for District 62. So it's great to have met some people from general service in person this weekend. In addition to general service, one of my most treasured service positions is helping to facilitate a big book study um, in Langley every Wednesday night. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has taken me to places I never thought I would go. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me back, well, I was going to say given me back a life. It's given me a new life. Um, and, and we've heard a lot about that this weekend from many speakers, for the people who got up and shared at the open call meetings, um, to Tony last night, um, to Joe on Friday night. I didn't get to hear Joe speak. I, I had to work on Friday, so I, I drove up here Friday evening. But um, Joe is a, a little brother to me in this fellowship. Tony is a big brother to me in this fellowship. Um, I know their stories well, and I know their love of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know um, how well they carry this message. We've been uh, laughing and joking for weeks coming up um, that I would be the Sunday morning spiritual speaker. <laughs> um, because we can't, I can't really talk about these spiritual principles and I can't really talk about um, the spiritual experience without talking about my alcoholic experience. Um, I was born in England into a family um, where heavy drinking and alcoholism was an hour by hour event. Almost everybody in my family um, suffers from alcoholism. Those that don't suffer from alcoholism um, <laughs> those that don't suffer from alcoholism deal with the trauma of dealing with those that do. Um, and I, I did not grow up in a uh, safe and protected environment. Um, words like position of neutrality, um, safe and protected, these are not things that described my experience um, from as far back as I can remember. Um, and I can remember making myself incredibly small um, and unseen. Um, and I can remember making myself as humorous as possible, whatever it is that I could do to sort of shift uh, whatever difficulty was about to explode in our living room, kitchen, backyard, front yard, you name it. Um, and I thought that that's the way everybody lived. And nothing that I have described to you 
yet qualifies me as an alcoholic. What it does qualify me for (laughs) is being wired a bit strange. Um, Never feeling safe, always being on the lookout for um, what difficulty or explosive situation might be coming doesn't exactly prepare you for making connections with other people. Um, And I struggled with that for as long as I could possibly remember. Um, I never felt a part of, I always felt on the outside looking in. And eventually that just led me to develop an attitude of not wanting to fit in. And anything that I could do to sort of shift my internal experience, um, shift the way that I felt, um, I sought after. Um, and and as, as, even as a young child, I was constantly getting into trouble, running off, disappearing, terrifying my parents as much as possible, lighting things on fire. <laughs> getting into trouble was exhilarating. It helped shift the way I was experiencing um, my life moment to moment. When I took my first drink when I was very young, and I, I, lots of people in AA have some sort of like um, vivid experience of taking their first drink, and I don't recall when I took my first drink. I just remember the period of time um, that I started drinking. And all those things that I didn't know I needed, alcohol provided. Suddenly I felt a part of. Suddenly like I felt like I could say the right things. Um, I no longer felt like I was on the outside looking in. I felt like I had found the solution. And if I could have lived in that sense of ease and comfort between drinks six and nine, yeah, (laughs) I wouldn't be here now, right? I'd be in the sense of ease and comfort between six to nine drinks. I didn't know at that time... um, that something was developing inside of me that was beyond my mental control. I didn't know at that time that something physical was going on with me. I had watched the consequences of alcoholism in my own home, but I didn't fully understand alcoholism. I didn't know that the members of my family that were drinking to excess, that were, drink, that were suffering the consequences of something that was beyond their mental control, And the longer I drank, the less of a solution it became to my human problems. There were many years, um, I would love to tell you that, you know, I had a strong desire to stop drinking, um, but I did not. I felt like alcohol solved what problems I had. And if you had difficulty with the way that I was while I was drinking, well, that was your problem. And I carried on that way for many years. I didn't know in any of these moments that I was searching for something to make me whole, to make me complete, to help me feel like a human being. All I knew was that when I took a couple of drinks, whatever problems I had disappeared, and whatever problems I created were not my problem. (laughs) And I carried on that way for many years. And my husband, um, you know, would describe our early years of drinking together as lots of fun. You know, we went on many adventures together. There are um, many stories, uh, some of which would make you laugh, um, some of which are only funny now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he remembered um, being at a barbecue one afternoon, um, and he was there earlier than me. And I arrived a few hours later, and he overheard a couple of people saying, sweet, Joanne's here. And there were a couple other people saying, ugh, Joanne's here. (laughs) (laughs) The first group were my people. (laughs) There are stories of, um, you know, me falling off my bar stool, splitting the back of my head open, refusing to get into an ambulance because they wouldn't let me bring my beer. I had just paid for it. 
<laughs> I made the paramedics wait until I finished my beer. <laughs> I came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 2007 after my drinking had ceased to become um, anything resembling fun. Um, I was no longer drinking to fit in. I was no longer drinking to feel a part of. Honestly, at that time in my life, I couldn't tell you why I had continued to drink. It was not really serving any sort of purpose. Um, it had provided a solution, and it was a good solution, until it was no longer any solution at all. And you would think that somebody engaging in drinking that's not providing any sort of solution, but is creating more problems than solutions, would just simply decide to stop, right? And we say, you know, many times throughout these big book studies that describing the problem of alcoholism, we compare them to other things, you know, that alcoholism is this twisted source of thinking that parallels our sound reasoning, right? Where we can apply our sound reasoning towards, let's say, a food allergy, where, where you ingest something and you experience um, terrible, awful consequences in the hours following ingesting that food, you would just simply decide not to pick that up again. Why can't we apply that sort of sound reasoning when it comes to the first drink? And herein lies the se first several years I, I came and went from Alcoholics Anonymous. And people would say to me, get a home group, get a sponsor, get a service position. I got a home group, a sponsor, and a service position more times than I could count. I walked all the way to the front of the room, from the back of the room, to grab a 24-hour chip more times than I could count. There were periods of time where I would have done anything to change my life. There were periods of time where I did do anything to change my life. We spent thousands of dollars that we didn't have trying to fix me. My husband stood by and watched me drink myself to death. That level of powerlessness is terrifying. The difficulty I was having in Alcoholics Anonymous was I was doing everything I was told to do. But nobody was explaining alcoholism to me. So I was applying a solution as if it were a checklist. Get a home group, get a sponsor, get a service position. And I would do this over and over and over and over and over again and all I got was drunk. And I started to think, perhaps maybe whatever was wrong with these people is not what's wrong with me. And this is the difficulty I had in the fellowship, was I would look at you, shiny, clean, joyous, free, happy, and I was not experiencing any of those things. I would shift my circumstances to try to fit in, hoping that that might work, change the color of my hair, wear nicer outfits, brush my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and still, whatever it was that you had, I wasn't getting it. I had difficulty um, making connections with women you know, I heard a lot of women talk yesterday. Um, is it the One Breath at a Time group? Is that the, yeah? Did I say that right? Yeah. I was here for your meeting yesterday. I, I, I can't explain to you 
how important the service of, of connecting with other women is, providing a, a meeting that's open um, to women. Because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, it seemed like women were all in step groups, but you had to be invited. And nobody really wanted to invite the drunk girl at the back of the room who still had puke in her hair and didn't brush her teeth. <laughs> I can't imagine why, right? In 2012, um, something awful happened during a blackout, and I was able to sort of stay sober for a few months, which I'd never been able to do before. And I'd asked a woman to sponsor me, and she'd only been sober for seven or eight months, and she relapsed. And then I relapsed. And then we tried to go through the steps again, and she relapsed, and then I relapsed again. And I remember sitting over a cup of coffee with her, and she said to me, I think we need more help than we're able to provide each other. And there's this guy that's been hanging around at the Nooner, and he puts on a big book study in Vancouver. Why don't we get a, a group of girls together and let's drive, let's drive downtown? And I was like, who's this guy? She's like, what's well, the name's Tony? We met him at the, the, the Nooner. And I'm like, that guy that's always hanging outside with the worksheets. He's <laughs> always trying to give away pieces of paper. I was telling uh, Christine and John last night, I thought he was like selling Amway in the parking lot or something like that. <laughs> at our old Alano club, you had to go out the back door and out this narrow... Uh, parking lot and there was no way to avoid him I mean he's a big dude right so he's standing there at the entranceway like hey sister how are you I'm like fine <laughs> I navigate my way around him and we would uh, get together on a Friday night we would get uh, sometimes it was just her and I sometimes there were a few other women and we would get in the car and we would drive downtown and I would sit at the back of the big book study and I couldn't hear anything. The thinking that would go on in my head was so loud that the minute the facilitators, Tony included, would start talking, I would just start thinking. Sometimes I would spend the whole hour thinking about telling Tony off after the meeting. <laughs> But there were moments in those hours where I learned about the allergy, and that made good sense to me. It suddenly described why I drank the way that I did once I started. And from that, I got the idea that if I just stayed away from the first drink, and if I just decided not to pick up that first drink, I wouldn't trigger the allergy, and I wouldn't suffer the consequences of my excessive drinking. And I thought, why didn't I think of that before? I just won't drink. And I would go back to the meetings in my local community, and I would hear just that, just don't drink. Okay, I can do that. I just won't drink. And I was able to put a few months together, the awful traumatic experience of the last drink, coupled with the principle of not picking up the first drink, this is the solution to alcoholism, right? I didn't need a book. I don't need a big book study. I don't need to listen to Tony. <laughs> <laughs> then one day, suddenly, it just seemed like a good idea. I don't know why. I mean, I, I probably had a list of reasons why later, right? We like to do that. It was the job. It was the husband. It was the financial trouble. It was the legal trouble. You know, these were the solutions I needed. I needed a good lawyer and a bank loan. And I needed my husband to leave me alone, right? These are the things we tell ourselves. If we can just get all of those ducks lined up, everything will be great. And one day, it just seemed like a good idea. 
Looking back on it now, what I know and understand now that I didn't know and understand then is that I had absolutely no solution to any of my human problems. And that living in self-reliant sobriety felt worse than my drinking. If I have to live this way, I might as well be drunk too. These are the types of insane thoughts that started to enter into my thinking. Suddenly that incredibly traumatic experience of the last drink didn't enter my mind at all. And in this one moment, I had been to a meeting that morning, it just seemed like a good idea to pick up a drink. And I would have told you on my last drink that I had suffered the very bottom of bottoms. And I found levels lower, let me tell you. Because I started drinking for that sickest reason of all, oblivion. oblivion. I just drank to not exist. I couldn't take one more breath inside my own body. Nobody in my family talked to me. My husband had all but left. The only thing he hadn't done was exit our residence. He builds cell phone towers for a living, so he travels. So I was alone all of the time. And I resolved myself to drink myself to death in my house. And it wasn't a dramatic experience. I wasn't in crisis. It didn't feel traumatic. It just seemed reasonable that I should just die because I, I just had nothing left to live. But there's just nothing inside of me. When they use terminology like spiritually bankrupt, I feel that. I experienced that, where you just have no place, no position, nothing. And I ended up having to go on the road with my husband because he was terrified he would come home and find me dead in our house. And I took a couple of road trips. I drank continuously through those road trips. I caused him extensive grief. His entire work crew were intoxicated for weeks on end with me because when I get drinking, everybody drinks too much. <laughs> And we were driving home, and he said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And we've had many conversations like this through the years. This one was different. He was completely and utterly disengaged from the situation. I could tell he felt nothing. And this is the story of alcoholism, right? Completely robbed of any life worth living. But anybody who was in direct contact with me was also robbed. I often think um, what that must have been like for him. I didn't have the capacity to think beyond myself back then. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't have, even if I'd tried. And I thought, that's it. It's, I'm, it's over. I can't, I, can't, I can't go on one more day. And something deep down within me said, go back to AA one last time. And I thought, okay, I'll go back to AA, and if it doesn't work this time, then I'll end it. And I meant it. I didn't go to any meetings. I phoned somebody that I care and trust, who was attached to the big book study, and I said, um, I can't even safely tell you that I want to recover or that I want to be sober. What I can tell you with, with certainty is that I want to die. And she said, meet me outside the Alano Club in 20 minutes and pick some stuff up from me. And I met her outside the Alano Club and she handed me the worksheets that I had been avoiding for four years. <laughs> I said, do I, do I, should I come into the meeting? She said, no, go home and start on the work. So I went home and I started on the work.
going through those worksheets, going through the book, having somebody um, talk to me about alcoholism really for the first time. It's, like, it's a bit like drowning, right? Like, that's how we spend our days, gasping for air. We don't even know that that's what we're experiencing until you, you sort of break the surface and get that first gulp of air. The idea that the allergy was not the, the, the entire description of the problem of alcoholism, it was like, what meetings have I been in? Why had I not heard this before? Why had nobody explained to me that I had this curious mental twist that ensured I had no sound reasoning around the first drink? And that only at certain times, right, I wouldn't be able to say no. That I could spend weeks, days, sometimes months refusing drinks and feeling like I had the solution to alcoholism. And then suddenly, in some strange moment, whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood, whether everything was going my way, whether nothing was going my way, I would pick up that drink despite a strong desire not to. And it became clear to me that all of those times that I got a home group, got a sponsor, got a service position, and even when sometimes people would try to take me through versions of the steps, we'd talk through the 12 and 12, maybe we'd refer to the big book here and there, that I could not apply any one of those principles because I didn't fully understand my problem. I thought I drank because I grew up in a tumultuous home. I thought I drank because of the things that had happened to me. I didn't know that I drank because of an allergy and a malady that centered in my mind. I mean, if I was just drinking for effect, I probably would have decided to stop and been able to carry that out once that effect was no longer giving me a solution. Why did I continue to drink for so many years past the point of it solving any of my problems? And then the steps took on an entirely different meaning. Then I understood that I was suffering from something that probably only a spiritual experience could solve. And then I understood the purpose behind that spiritual experience. I know many people come to Alcoholics Anonymous and they start to hear the words God, and they think religion, and they, you know, there's other people who say, don't, don't talk about God too much, you scare away the newcomer. I didn't have that experience. I didn't necessarily want to be a religious person. I, I didn't necessarily want to sign on for anything like that. But I was dying, and I would have done anything. Um, if you told me that I needed to sign on for something like that, I would have done it. I would have attempted it. Learning in the big book study about this spiritual experience, it's incredible that none of those things are necessary. But all of those things are welcome. You don't have to set aside any of your beliefs, um, spiritual or otherwise, in order to have this spiritual experience. And I remember it sort of hitting me profoundly one night. I don't know if this is a, something original to Tony or if, or if he's learned it somewhere else. And, but it just hit me right between the eyes that the true believer, the agnostic, and the atheist all have the same problem. Whatever their belief system, it's not working if you're still drinking. If, we're, if, religious, if religion were the solution to alcoholism, religious people wouldn't suffer from alcoholism. But a religious practice doesn't spell the necessary spiritual experience, right? It's a change sufficient enough to bring about recovery from something that's killing us. And that this lack of power was really what my core problem was. That I had all kinds of ideas that I could wrap my head around all kinds of principles. I could sit in a big book study or in an AA meeting, and I could really sound like I knew what I was talking about. But I had no idea how to apply any of it. 
And worse yet, I had no idea why I needed to apply any of it. So understanding alcoholism in its entirety, understanding the powerlessness connected to it, was vital. What was the likelihood that I would continue to apply spiritual principles to my human problems if I didn't understand fully that I was unqualified and lacked the power to do anything about my alcoholic problem? I was like a lot of people. I just did whatever I needed to do to fit in. You go to AA meetings and out for coffee with other members of the fellowship, and everybody's talking about God. I'm like, okay, I'll talk about God. You know, I don't really know why we're talking about God, but I don't want anybody to know that I don't know, so I'm just going to talk like I know. I'm a used car salesman, so I'm very good at that. <laughs> I was outside last night talking to two young women. Um, I don't know if they're here this morning. But we sort of compared this. uh, We were talking about step one experiences. And we sort of compared this to uh, a nuclear reaction. A nuclear reaction can be contained as long as certain scientific principles are put into practice. If those scientific principles are not put into practice, reactivity gets out of control. No human power on earth can contain the nuclear reaction. Sound familiar? This is my experience. The minute these spiritual principles are applied, I begin to have a different experience. The problem was, was that I was sitting around talking about spiritual principles and I wasn't applying any of them. Because I lacked the humility to say to anybody that I didn't know how. And that's where a big book study became incredibly important. Big book study workshops provided a safe space to be sponsored by other women. Big book study workshops provided a safe space for me to compare what I was being told by what the book had to say. And what the book had to say was incredibly important. And it's what I had been missing those seven years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Every time I went into a 12 and 12 study or somebody wanted to take me through living sober, (laughs) I thought I was doing the things necessary to create the change sufficient enough to recover. What I didn't understand was that I was coming at it from my own experience. And what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous provides to us is the shared experience of our founding members. It's an instruction manual on how to apply these spiritual principles. And ever since I have been applying these spiritual principles, all sorts of remarkable things have happened. Um, Life is not easy every day, as many of us know who've who've had some continued sobriety. But a relationship with something greater than myself that exists deep down within has not only provided me with a solution to alcoholism, it has given me freedom from the bondage of me. And if you had tried to sell me on that in the beginning, I would have been like, get a day pass. Like... (laughs) The idea that somehow, some way, I would be able to go uh, a month, six months, a year without drinking was was, not something I could comprehend. So to live by spiritual principles and have freedom from the bondage of self... And when everything is chaotic around me, to still have something calm, peaceful, and loving going on deep down within, uh, I, you know, I'm a kid that grew up never safe and protected. I'm a kid that grew up always needing to know what was going on behind me. I was a kid that grew up needing to know who was coming through the door, who was leaving out the door, what time was it, who was going to be there when I got home from school. So peace, serenity, 
calm. These are not principles that I understand. They feel counterintuitive. They still sometimes feel very counterintuitive. But the practical application of an inventory to share that experience with another human being, to share that experience um, with a power deep down within, the understanding that there are many things in my life that I am not qualified to solve and that new management needed to be brought in. I needed somebody else to show me how that actually happens. What is the practical application of that? Not just tell me, show me. And I found that in those big book study workshops. You guys heard Tony talk last night about some of his past experience. And one of the most wonderful things about working with Tony um, is that he starts to work with you, you mentioned last night, uh, before you're even aware of it. Um, permission is not something <laughs> that's asked. And, and of all the profound moments I've had in sobriety, um, one of them was really recognizing for the first time the amount of courage it took to stand in a parking lot full of people who didn't want him there and carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to those of us that were dying of alcoholism. And I remember thinking, like, what must that have taken? Because we lived in a community that didn't want a big book study. They didn't want a guy in the parking lot handing out worksheets after the meeting. And they certainly didn't want him inside our meetings talking about God. It took a lot of courage to stand in that parking lot and recognize that maybe not everybody in that meeting was dying of alcoholism, but there was a few of us that definitely were. Whether we knew it or not, we needed the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's these spiritual principles in action, right? God, remove this fear from me and direct my attention to what you would have me be in this moment. And then following it through. Not just saying it, not just talking about it over a cup of coffee, but the actual action of it. Setting aside our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own fears, and doing what's necessary in order to carry this message to the people who are dying. And that is how I live my life today. Um, most of my days are spent getting up and going to committee meetings and big book study workshops and 12-step work and making sure that this message is still accessible to the next generation that comes after us. And none of that would be possible without this experience, this continued experience. And you can't really talk about these spiritual principles, um, these steps, our fellowship, um, and you definitely can't talk about spiritualism um, as a basis of living without our incredibly vital 11th step. I think a lot of what we miss in spiritual practice is the understanding of what goes on in our thinking. And many of us in the fellowship will appreciate that sometimes our thinking is not really in line with what our actions are, right? And one of those bumper stickers that I absolutely could not stand all the way through my first years, uh, you know, in and out of AA was fake it until you make it. I didn't want to fake it. I had faked it my whole life. I wanted something authentic. I didn't want something curated. I wanted to get up here and share my experience with you that was real, right? I didn't want to just get up here and be profound and entertaining. I want everybody in this room to experience what I experienced. I want everybody in this room to experience what it's like to have a daily relationship with something greater than themselves. The big book study, and Tony touched a little bit on it last night, did something that I'd never really been told or shown before. It took me all the way through. I was practicing the 11th step before I went on my very first amends. And that might sound um, backwards, right? Aren't you supposed to at least get started on step nine before you start on step 11? And I can't imagine how those amends would have gone without the principle in the 11th step. 
Like I said earlier, there are many things that I am powerless over in my life. The ability to be able to outgrow fear, to overcome these resentments, to set aside my own thinking, to bring into my my daily activities what God would have me be in any given moment was vital if I was going to get in my car and drive to somebody that I formerly hated or drive to somebody who hates me and try to clean up the wreckage of my past. How could you possibly suggest to somebody to go out and do some of the things that we need to do in order to recover unless we have this connection, unless we have gone through this practice before we set out on our day of bringing God's will into all of our activities? And God has shown up in my life in many beautiful ways. And I remember seven or eight months sober driving to a particular amends. Actually, I'll back that up a little bit. I remember looking at this particular amends on my list. There were two individuals in a particular situation. I'll share in a general way. I had interfered in their marriage. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I kept looking at it on my, ninth, on my eight step list. There was a desperate need within me to clean up this mistake. But I intuitively knew, because of the 11th step, that I needed to pause. Because if I had tried to get in contact with either one of them, I would have caused harm. If I'd contacted him, it would have caused her harm. If I'd contacted her, it would have caused him harm. There was no way for me to initiate contact with these people to clean up the wreckage of my past without causing harm. And I brought it to Tony and said, this one is just, I I need to get this done. I need. (laughs) I want this off my list. And he just said in his very cavalier way, Pray about it. When the time's right, something will happen. So I did. And two weeks later, on a Monday night, at a meeting I rarely go to, they walked in. They are not members of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was no reason for them to be there. And I was about ready to jump out of my seat and fly like a maniac across the room to make this amends. And something deep down within me was like, stop. Think for a moment as to why these people are in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe one of them is here because it's their first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and they don't need a lunatic from their past (laughs) running across the room to apologize for something incredibly painful. And so I paused. These are 11 step principles. These are these principles in action. And I waited and the meeting ended and I stood up out of my chair and I was prepared to leave without making any contact with them. And they made eye contact from across the room and the body language was okay. And so I slowly crossed the room and said hello and got some preliminary information that, you know, she uh, wanted to check out a meeting for whatever reason. And I did not in that moment make the amends. What I did do was give her my phone number and reassured her that if I could be of any service or any help or if she had any questions about Alcoholics Anonymous, I would be happy to provide them if I could. And if I couldn't provide those answers, I would definitely put her in contact with somebody that could. And we parted ways. And five days later, she sent me a text message and asked me if I would come to her house and talk to her. I got in my car, and as I was driving uh, to the agreed time and place at her house, every fiber of my being was telling me to turn around everything. 
my mind was spinning, trying to come up with excuses to avoid this situation. Just call her and tell her you're not feeling well and you need to do it another night. Don't go. Every fiber of my being. And some of us might have been, oh, that's God's will, doesn't want me to go, right? And I took a big deep breath and I said, God, remove this fear and direct my attention to what you would have me be in this moment. And I probably chanted it 30 times and my phone rang while I was driving and I answered it and it was a sponsee who had relapsed. And I immediately knew where my attention needed to be. And we talked for the next 15 minutes. And before I knew it, my car was in her driveway. And by the time I finished the phone call with another alcoholic, who was in crisis, I felt ready. And I went into the house, and we talked at length, and I made the amends the way our book instructs us to, without expectation of forgiveness, without any expectation whatsoever. I told her the truth, that she was not crazy, and that I had actively tried to make her think she was. And the relief that washed over her face was something I will never forget. And I would have never made it there that night without our 11th step. At the end of our conversation about our past, she shared with me about her drinking. And a ninth step turned into a 12th step. And a 12th step turned into a first step. And I got to explain to her the problem of the allergy. And I got to explain to her the problem of the malady that centers in the mind. And I watched the light return to her eyes right then and there at the idea that she had been suffering from something beyond her control and that she might actually be able to apply a solution to it that could work. And that that solution was not her. And that it could be found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous over cups of coffee and big books, and in big book study workshops, and it was accessible to her anytime she would like it to be. I have so many stories like that over the past seven and a half years. Every day is a day where we must carry God's will into all of our activities. God's will doesn't always feel light and airy and pink cloud-like. Sometimes it's terrifying. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's driving to places you don't want to go. Sometimes it's setting aside your thinking and really trying to find that intuitive thought and trying to follow it. And if we can apply these principles and experience the outgrowing of fear, the overcoming of resentments, freedom from the bondage of self. What an incredible thing to be a part of for somebody who wanted to die seven and a half years ago. I fully understand now that it's the application of these things in our daily life that ensure our continued sobriety and our continued relationship with something greater than ourselves. Everything is about my spiritual condition now. It's not about whether I'm feeling well. It's not about how much money I make. It's not about where I go or what I do. It's about where I put my energy. Am I putting my energy into what it is that I think I need? Or am I putting my energy into this relationship that provides me with everything I need? This relationship has not once let me down. There are a list of things that I want. A list. We're human beings, we want. If I follow and apply these principles, I'm provided with what I need. I am not an expert on what I need. I am still not an expert on what it is that I need. I have been provided with things and experiences I wouldn't have sought after myself. And that's the beautiful result of a relationship with God. This has been an incredible weekend, and um, I'm very grateful to have been a part of it. Um, there are many of you that I've met on Zoom. It's been fantastic to meet you guys in person. 
I hope that if you've been sober a period of time and you're not experiencing some of the things that I've talked about today, that Tony talked about last night, and that Joe definitely talked about on Friday, it's not too late. Big book study workshops are now more accessible than ever. I know some of you have stated very loudly this weekend that you don't particularly care for Zoom. But making Alcoholics Anonymous more accessible is our most vital responsibility. And this pandemic created a space where Alcoholics Anonymous became more accessible to everybody. I've heard over the weekend that District 62's, um, some, some of the groups had to fold. And I, I am incredibly sorry to hear that. I hope that the members of those groups have found spaces in other groups. Um, but if you're feeling like you're not experiencing some of the things we've talked about this weekend, then I invite you to join us on the Big Book Study workshops that happen uh, Tuesday and Thursday nights, uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, Wednesday, the Keystone Group has a closed Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Um, because that's where we're doing it, shoulder to shoulder, carrying this message to people who are dying of alcoholism. But most importantly, to the drunk girls in the back of the room, I don't know if we have any here today, but if we do, I was one of you. It doesn't have to continue to be your story. Many of us are recovering each day. Um, and I hope that you'll connect with one of us this weekend. And I hope that you've heard the message of Alcoholics Anonymous this weekend. And I thank you very much for all of your hospitality um, and for a really fantastic roundup. Thank you. Thank you.